fantastic. Lord, you are so mighty, so powerful, Lord. And you're so filled with love, Lord, how you love us. How you love us, dear God. I think of what Isaiah, where you said, uh, concerning your people, I have you engraved upon the palm of my hand. And every time he looks at his hand, he thinks about us. I'm really sure of that. Thank you for the love that's so enduring and so full and so grand. There's a lot of needs here this morning. There's so much going on, so very, very, very much. And it's sometimes it just buggles your mind about everything that's going on. So today, Lord, if there's anyone that's troubled, anyone that's discouraged, anyone that's downhearted, anyone that's lonely, anyone that's not feeling well, that you will touch them big time today. And Lord, that you will walk among us today by your Holy Spirit. We will open our hearts and our spirits to you, Lord, and just thank you for what you're going to say to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Now, what I'd like you to do next is greet someone. Just stand up and greet someone. Throw a kiss across the aisle, whatever you want to do. But greet one another. Please make your way back to your seats and remain standing through the first song together and then through the rest of the song service. You can sit or stand and let's join together. How firm a foundation.
scripture a lot of you know comes from Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And the next song we're going to do is called Ancient Words, and it's about the Bible and the scripture, the word, how important it is to our lives for teaching and the timeless lessons that it has for us. And this week I was... I was wishing that Vicki Young were here because I thought, man, she would just have the perfect thing to say for this song. And and I opened up my email. I, I kid you not, like minutes later, there was this um, note from Vicki, and she had read the list of songs for the week, and, and she wrote me a little special note about the song Ancient Words. So I wanted to share that with you. She said, I truly love in my heart the song Ancient Words. Every now and then I wonder at the thought of these, of having these ancient words of my father at my ready to read. I ask myself, who but an ancient history buff goes to the library to check out and read a 3,000-year-old book and expect to be able to read it and have it be relevant to current day life? I always stand amazed at how God gave and preserved us his words, current for each soul throughout the ages, and I don't have to search for it or translate it. All of that hard work has been done for me. But for it to take root in me, I must spend the time digging into it and gleaning its pages. Many days I afford myself long digging times and feast on his words. Often, though, it's only a snack to get me through the day. Sadly, some days I don't even take a nibble, but I go forward with gleanings from the previous day because the tyranny of the urgent is so important or I'm lazy or preoccupied, or maybe I'm ill or tired. But then I read the lyrics and I hear the words and music to this song, Ancient Words, and I am in awe and tears once again, and I'm encouraged to come feast on these words and let them sink into my soul and water my faith. So the ancient words, the scripture, gives us strength and helps us cope in this fallen world today. So let's sing about this together.
as we do gather here today, uh, we realize that you are the giver of life, and we are so grateful for all that you've done in our lives. I pray now that as we prepare to go into your word, that you would speak to us. 
Lord, even though it's a story that many people have heard before, I pray that we would see how this applies to our life and that we could take the principles, Lord, and they would help us through the, the issues that we're going through in life right now. Lord, we love you, and we want to express that to you now through our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Thank you to the worship team. Appreciate the worship. Okay, if we've got any children in here, they're welcome to head on over to Sunday school at this point. Whoops, excuse me. I'll let you guys go down here. <laughs> All right, almost bumped Joy there right in the arm. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you might notice there's a little bit of construction that's been going on. That's the very first part of next week. This, this sanctuary should look a lot different. We're preparing to, to put some shiplap in here. Uh, once all the shiplap's in here, we're going to move the communion table over here. We've got a baptismal tank now for the very first time in our history. And uh, we're waiting to stain that. We can't baptize until we stain it. So once we get that stained, that will be going over here, and we will be able to have baptisms during our worship service. Isn't that awesome? So we're really excited about that. So uh, come excited next week. It should look a lot different. I don't know if we'll be done by then, but uh, there should be a lot of changes. want to encourage you, if you would, to open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And today we're going to be looking at verses 20 through 54. And I think the topic today is going to be a topic that uh, really affects everybody here. Uh, are you facing a giant in your life? Now, I imagine some of you are going through some difficult times right now. Some of you are facing obstacles that seem insurmountable in your life right now. We all have giants that we have to deal with at different times in our life. But fear is one of those things that can absolutely paralyze us and it can cause us to miss out on many potential blessings in our life. If we allow the fear to dictate over top of us what we're going to do and what we're not going to do, it can stop us from being what God wants us to be. David Jeremiah writes, You may stand at the threshold of God's greatest promise for you, but you'll never claim his blessing if you let fear dominate your life. I mean, God may be getting ready to bless you. In fact, I've said over and over again, if, if you're taking a step forward spiritually, you're going to get whacked. The enemy is going to come at you to discourage you. He doesn't want you to go forward. He wants you to stop. He wants you to quit. He wants you to give up. If you step forward spiritually, expect to get whacked. It's going to happen. But we can't let that fear dominate us because if we do, we'll never claim the blessings that God was going to give us if, if we let the fear go ahead and win. Well, fear is just one of many giants that we face in our life, and I hope that as we grow spiritually, uh, that we'll get a little more courageous as we see God at work in our life. And really, as we mature as Christians, that's one of the things we find out. When we're young, we don't have a whole catalog of, uh, of proof that God is faithful. God is faithful to answer our prayers. God is faithful to help us get through. But as we get older and we go through different seasons in our life, then we can see God has walked with us every step of the way. And when the next crisis hits, we know that God is going to be there with us as well. I think one of the best definitions of courage uh, and fear that I've ever seen, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something is more important than fear. All things being equal, you could be on the second or third story floor of a building, in the second or third story, and you can look down at the ground below, and there could be a whole bunch of people down below you, and they could be saying, jump, jump, and you'd say, you're out of your mind. But if that building is on fire, and all of a sudden you see that, boy, may maybe that's the best option that I have, all of a sudden you're willing to step forward. Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something is more important than that fear, and maybe that thing that's more important is your very life, Amen. You know, but courage doesn't necessarily mean that you're not afraid. Courage is realizing that something is more important than whatever it is that you're afraid of. One of the things I love doing is playing basketball. In fact, when I grew up, I had a basketball hoop out in front of my house, and I'd just go out by the hour and just be shooting away, and I always had dreams, you know, to jump up and slam dunk that ball. You guys ever been there, you guys? You just want to do it, man. You want to go airborne. You want to slam dunk that ball. And I would work at it, and I would work at it, and I would jump as high as I could. And I'm living proof of the saying that white men can't jump. 
because I'd get about five inches. And I'd swing as hard as I could, and I would hit the bottom of the net on the basket. I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't get up there. So my solution was you lower the basket. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> then you do it. But can you imagine facing a giant that was nine feet, nine inches tall? Now, to put that in perspective for us today, I want you to think of yourself in a gymnasium standing under the basketball hoop. And as you look and you see how high that hoop is, realize that that giant's head is three inches away from the rim. If that giant were to go on his tippy toes, his head would touch the rim. And as we're looking at our story today, that kind of brings into perspective just how huge Goliath was. Well, Goliath wasn't the only giant that was in, mentioned in the Bible. We find uh, giants were mentioned in Genesis, Genesis chapter 6, and we see that that was the Nephilim. We see that the 12 Hebrew sp spies went into the promised land, and they saw giants in the land. And because of the fear of the giants, 10 of the 12 said, we can't do it. But you had two of the 12 who said, look at the size of them. How can we miss? And they were willing to go into the promised land, and they were blessed. We saw Og, king of Bashan, the last of the Amorites. He had a bed that was 13 and a half feet long. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11. And then we see that the Egyptians had a, an individual that was seven and a half feet tall. And Benaiah, uh, one of David's mighty men, wrestled the spear away, and he killed him. And we see that in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 23. But imagine facing an opponent nine feet, nine inches tall. Robert Wadlow was the tallest person in modern recorded history at 8 feet 11 inches. Now, he was only 21 years old, and usually today when they get really tall, you see it with some of the basketball players that try, not all of them, but some of them are really clumsy in the way that they're built and their body's just not working quite right. But this individual at 21 years old was 8 feet 11 inches tall, and you get the idea as he stands beside the ladies who are right next to him, just how big he was. But he, he was clumsy. He couldn't do the things average people could do. Probably had to walk with a cane. But Goliath, he was nine feet. He was almost a foot taller. He was nine feet, nine inches tall. He was massive and powerful and about 750 pounds of muscle. And you can imagine what it would have been like to see a giant like that, to have to face that individual. Imagine the strength that he would have. Now, unbeknown to Jesse, David's father, he was sending Jesse into an area, into a battle that would be for the ages, and he probably just thought he was sending his son to the front lines. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 17 through 20, then Jesse said to his son David, take now for your brothers an ephah, a dried grain, and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of, of the thousand." And see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they, and all the men of Israel, were in the valley of Elah, fighting the Philistines. And so Jesse figures, well, I need to find out what's going on with my sons. But back in those days, they had no mess hall. Back in those days, they had no galley. Back in those days, if they wanted to eat, the families would need to provide the food for them when they were on the front lines. So you notice that Jesse goes ahead and he tells David to go to the front lines to take the food out there and make sure that they've got enough food to eat. But he does something else that catches my attention. He goes ahead and he takes 10 cheeses and he tells, Jess, uh, tells, tells David, excuse me, tells David to take, uh, take it to the captain of the thousand. And I'm wondering, is there a little bribery here? Why would he do something like that? I wonder if what he was really saying is, David, I want you to go to the front line. I want you to give the cheeses to the commander. And hopefully he'll leave my boys off of the front line. Hopefully they won't have to go fight. Let's bribe them a little bit. Let's give them a little bit of extra stuff. And I wonder if there was a little bit of, of that that was going on. And so we pick up our story today in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 20 through 54. And if you haven't turned there, I encourage you to do that at this point. So Jesse has just sent David at this point, we see in verses 20 through 22, it says, So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things, and he went as Jesse had commanded him. 
And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting uh, to, to, to the fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies at the hand of the supply keeper. He ran to the army and he came and he greeted his brothers. Now, I think if David had his way, he would not have been with his father's sheep. If you remember earlier on in chapter 16, we saw that Samuel came, he, he talked to Jesse, he asked him if, they, if he had sons, and one by one he takes the seven sons of, of Jesse and goes through and finds out that none of those sons are the sons that God had intended for him to anoint. And so he said to, to Jesse, he said, do you have any more sons? He said, well, yes, I've got my youngest who's out in the field. And he brings David to him. And it was David whom he said, that's the one God wants me to anoint. And so the other brothers were there. I think it's important that we understand that as we see how things unfold here as we're moving on. They witnessed that. Those who were older than him, especially Eliab the oldest, probably really wrestled with the fact that they weren't the ones who got the anointing. It was their little brother, David. And so they're holding that in, and I think we're going to see that come out. So David was a warrior by, by nature. In fact, we see that he wasn't allowed to build the temple of God because he had so much blood on his hands. And so I don't think he wanted to be back with the sheep. I think David wanted to be out there on the front lines. And when he had the opportunity to take the, the, the food and, the, and drop the cheese off and everything else, he immediately heads to the front line to see what's happening. But even in spite of all of that, the mission that David's father had given to him was find out how things are going with your brothers and get that information back to me. Verse 23, then as he talked with them, there was a champion, the, the Philistine of Gath. Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. Now, one of the practices that occurred in ancient times was occasionally they would look for champions. It's funny, we watched a Western yesterday, and they had two old men in which the battle was going on back and forth, and all these people were dying, and in the end of the movie, the two individuals had to come and settle it among themselves, and, and it saved everybody else from being killed. Well, we see that back in ancient days. What would happen sometime is you would get two armies together, and instead of the entire armies going out and just slaughtering everybody else, they would pick two champions. They're, they're two strongest men. And they would put them against each other. And whoever prevailed, then that side won. And all the other lives were saved. And so for the Philistines, their man was Goliath. He was a massive giant. The Bible describes him as a champion, and usually they were able to avoid armed conflict. Can you imagine today if they took Vladimir Putin on one side and Joe Biden on the other side to square it out for us? No, I don't think I want to go there. <laughs> but Goliath had been taught in the Israelites for 40 consecutive days at this point. Have you ever wondered about that? You look in the Bible and you see that number 40 over and over and over. And you wonder, well, what is the significance of the number 40? Uh, for one thing, we see that Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, here we see Goliath was, was mocking for 40 days. We see that Jesus was sent out into the wilderness to be tempted for 40, 40 days. Well, the number 40 was used in Scripture to indicate times of trial and testing. And usually when that number 40 is giving, that period of trial and testing is coming to an end. It comes to an end. The, the exodus ended at 40 years. You know, Goliath's mocking ended at 40 days. The testing of Jesus in the wilderness ended at 40 days and 40 nights. So Goliath's testing here was about ready to come to an end. He may have a big mouth. He may be giving him a hard time, but it was all about to end. Verse 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, meaning Goliath, they fled from him and they were dreadfully afraid. I think it's important for us to realize that the army of Israel wasn't anything like we see today. It was a bunch of, of, of ragtag individuals that were out there. They had pitchforks. They had other things. There was only two swords in the entire army, and that, that was uh, King Saul and his son Jonathan. 
Everybody else was doing it in just a ragtag way, and they were absolutely terrified. The Philistines had weapons. They did not. So the soldiers were terrified at Goliath's size and strength, and they wouldn't fight him. Now, remember how big this guy is after looking at that picture we saw earlier. He was intimidating. You know, and what had happened is the Philistines had intruded into the territory of Judah. And they not only wanted where they had gotten to, they wanted more. And so this was big trouble. The, the people of Judah were going to be in servitude to the Philistines unless they could fight this off. Well, verse 25. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills, the ki- who kills him, the king will enrich, number one, with great riches, number two, will give him his daughter, and number three, give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Can you imagine that? Your, your, your parents would be delivered from heaven to pay any taxes for the rest of your life. You'd be wealthy. You'd get all this stuff. You'd be married to the king's daughter. That would put you in a, a, a real... Real special position there. Well, this is the first time that David had heard that, and it intrigued him, but he wanted to make sure that he was hearing things right. So he begins to ask a little bit bit more. Verse 26, David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away this reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David had no respect, zero, for Goliath. This individual was defiling the living God. How do you react when you hear people defiling the name of God, mocking the name of God? Does it get you upset? We know exactly how David ended up responding. Well, the Israelite soldiers were terrified of this giant man. Nobody wanted to face him one-on-one. But David saw him as an uncircumcised. This is a statement that is very derogatory. He saw him as an uncircumcised Philistine who was insulting the God that he loved. This uncircumcised Philistine who was insulting God. Now, if I were to ask if you were to go back to the Old Covenant, if we were to go back to Genesis chapter 17, what was the sign of the, new, uh, of the Old Covenant? Circumcision, right? Well, this uncircumcised Philistine wasn't even under the covenant of God. And he was mocking God, and it was really ticking David off. In David's mind, Goliath was ultimately fighting against God, not him. And Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, If God is for us, who can be against us? And that's going through David's mind as he's dealing with this. If I were to ask you today, what kind of giants are you facing in your life? Maybe some of you here have physical illness things going on. You haven't even told anyone. You're just wrestling with that. You're holding it. You got a negative, negative uh, diagnosis from the doctor, and you're hurting on the inside. You've got this giant in front of you. Maybe today you're here and you find yourself in financial turmoil. Things haven't gone well. Now all of a sudden you're way behind. You don't know how you're going to get to the next day. You've got this giant that's in front of you. How about relational issues? Maybe some of you here today or some of you watching have had your spouse say that they're going to divorce you. Maybe your marriage is coming to an end. Maybe you're having difficulties with your children. You've got this massive giant that's standing in front of you and you don't know how you're going to deal with him. Perhaps today you're struggling with a particular sin in your life, something you've had for years and you can't get over this thing and you know it could destroy your life. You don't know what to do. Maybe you've got this giant right in front of you. Or perhaps it's a bad habit that you've had for years, and you just can't overcome that bad habit, and you really want to, and you're wrestling. I guarantee you, each and every one of us here have a giant in our life. But I think it's important for us to realize that the principles that we find in 1 Samuel chapter 17 apply to each and every one of these. And it's a shame that today we look at the story of David and Goliath as a story for children that's said in Sunday school, when in reality the story of David and Goliath is a story for each and every one of us and the giants that we're facing in our life and how we move through these problems, these issues that we're facing. In all of these, we need to trust God and we need to face our fears. 
Because so often when things get difficult, what we do is we turn and we run. We don't want to go to it. We go against it. And you watch as the story goes on and what David's going to end up, he's, he's not going to run. He's going to, well, he will run. He's going to run at Goliath. He's going to take this giant on. And sometimes that's what we need to do with these issues that we're dealing in our, with in our own life. We need to trust God. And then we need to face our fears. Verse 27, and the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Those standing nearby confirmed the words of King Saul to David. The problem is that the soldiers were terrified and that they wouldn't face their fears. What kind of fears are you facing today? I know of a, a lady who struggled with going to church because she was terrified of crossing the McCullough Bridge. There's little things that happen to us that uh, even within the body of Christ that, that we don't even realize. But the fear of crossing a bridge could keep somebody away from going to church, keep somebody away from doing the things that they would normally do. And I didn't realize how big of a problem it was until I read an article back in the San Francisco Bay Area. And you get back there in the bridges, and, and like I, I lived right by the San Mateo Bridge. That bridge was seven miles long. And I'll tell you, if you got caught in a traffic jam out there in an earthquake, you're, you're in trouble. And so some people, in fact, many people, really struggle with the fear of crossing bridges. And I found it quite interesting in this article how they dealt with that particular fear. So what these, these uh, counselors were doing is they would get in the car with the individuals. And you want to guess what they did? They went back and forth. But it wasn't just back and forth. It was back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Why were they doing that? Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Because th th they were overcoming that fear. So it became normal to go back and forth across the bridge. You see, people who are paralyzed by fear say, I can't do that. But the thing that we really need to do is face that fear and go forward and do whatever that, that thing is that's terrifying us. Verse 28, now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Now, here you've got Eliab angry because his younger brother is on the front line, and he's accusing him of being prideful. Who do you think's really being prideful? Well, you've got Goliath out there, very prideful. But who's being prideful in this particular case? You've got Eliab, who's very, very upset that, it, that his brother would even come out there. He's fuming, and maybe he's fuming because of what Samuel had done. Because Samuel had anointed him. Samuel had chosen him. Now you're out in my area. Why are you out here with me? Have you ever noticed that some of the most hurtful attacks that ever happened come from our own family? Matthew chapter 10, verse 36, Jesus said, A man's enemies will be those of his own household. We see that with Joseph. Joseph didn't do anything wrong. And yet at the same time, Joseph was hated by his brothers and he was sold into slavery. We see the same thing with Moses. We find that his brother Aaron, his sister Miriam, they, they were upset at him and they were grumbling about him and they end up paying the price because of that, but they were attacking Moses. We see in the case of David, David's just simply obeying his father. He goes out to the front lines and here now his brother, at least alive, and I'm sure the other ones were upset that he was out there. I think it's amazing to me that even Jesus had trouble with his family. In Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 21, then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. The crowds were gathering around Jesus because of the teachings, because of the miracles. But when his own people, when his own family heard about it, and this included his mother, they went out to lay hold of him. Why? For they said he's out of his mind. How about you? Have you had some of your families think you're out of your mind because you've come to Christ, because you've given your life to Christ? you got to be out of your mind. Yeah, it's, they're, they're just brainwashing you. I'll tell you what, I'd rather get brainwashed this way any day than what I see on the outside. And we're not brainwashing anybody. We look at the Word of God. God does the cleansing. 
Well, if you've got a family member that disapproves of your walk with the Lord, uh, it's, it's because the enemy has blinded them. And just pray for them, love on them, uh, let them see the difference in your life, and hopefully God will be working in, in, in their lives to the point where they come to faith in him. Verses 29 and 30. And David said, what have I done now? What have I done? Is there not a cause? Then he turned to him toward, uh, then he turned from him toward another, and he said the same thing, and these people answered him as the first ones did. If Eliab was agitated at anyone, he should have been agitated at, at Goliath, not, not at David. Verse 31, now when the words which David spoke were heard, they were reported to Saul, and he sent for him. So David's out there talking about this uncircumcised Philistine. And the people heard that, and they're terrified. They're, they're grasping at straws. And so they go to King Saul, and they say, I think we got somebody that would fight him. And it was David. And so Saul would be surprised to find out that it was just a boy. Verse 32, then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail, him because, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go out and fight this Philistine. Now, Warren Wiersbe writes, when we walk by sight, we calculate everything from a human perspective, and this always leads to discouragement. But when we walk by faith, God comes into the equation, and that changes everything. And that's exactly what David was doing. Saul was walking by sight. He was discouraged. We cannot beat this giant. David was walking by faith. When I go out there, I'm not going alone. I'm going to have a companion, and that companion is God. Verse 33, then Saul said to David, you are not able to go out against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. Isn't it interesting how so often Satan uses friendly voices, quote unquote, in order to discourage? You can't do that. There's no way you can do that. Well, maybe God had another plan in all of this. David had been born for such a time as this. And ladies and gentlemen, with all that we're going through on this earth, it's not an accident that we're here right now. We have been born for such a time as this. We have been called to stand up for the things of God and live our lives in a way that honor him. David had been born for such a time as that with his battle against the giant. We've got different giants today to battle, don't we? But we're to be battling with those giants. Today, Christians aren't the most popular people in the world, especially when it comes to politics and the media. Uh, we make a lot of enemies because of our faith in God. We make a lot of enemies because of our belief in God's word and the principles that are shared there. Every which way we turn, we're being discouraged by people from walking and living our faith. In our colleges and university, our Christian students go there and they get battered because of their faith in Christ. Uh, the enemy's always trying to knock them out. Satan would have us believe that we are alone in our Christian walk, that, that we're the ones that are crazy. There's, there's no one else. You, you're by yourself, loser. David Jeremiah says, there are now 102 million people attending church each week. We're not alone. We're not anywhere near alone. There are now 102 million people attending church each week. Uh, Lee, Leith Anderson tells us. It turns out that, basket, that baseball, basketball, and football games in the United States drew a combined 94 million fans during the same year. In other words, more people attend church in one week than professional baseball, basketball, and football games in one year. In fact, when all the numbers are crunched, attendance at sports events works out to about 2% of church attendance. So the next time somebody says to you, oh, if only people were as passionate about their church as they are about their sports teams, you need to remind them that the pews are 50 times more popular than stadium seats week after week. It's all a matter of perspective. You see, the lie is that you're all alone. You're walking out there alone. There's, there's no backup. You don't, you know, the, 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 the church is dying. The fact of the matter is, is there are a lot of people out there, brothers and sisters, who are walking with you, and we just need to realize, uh, you know, even more important than the number of Christians walking with you is that God is walking with you. 
verses 34 through 36. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and I struck it. And I delivered the lamb from its mouth. And, and when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Now, David was a young man, but he'd gone through some really bad experiences. Maybe some of you have gone through bad experiences. He was put in the position where a lion attacked the flock or a bear attacked the flock. As crazy as it may have seemed, he went after that bear and he went after that lion and he killed them. And do you know what that did for him? That strengthened him in his faith of God. That strengthened him for when really desperate situations happen that he could go over in faith of God and have victory. Maybe you can look back over the course of your life and see a few times in which you went through really difficult times and you came out on the other end and you saw the faithfulness of God. And because of that faithfulness of God today, you are so much stronger knowing that when you've got to face this giant this time, God will be with you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Well, the uncircumcised Goliath wasn't in a covenant relationship with God. He was, he was the one who was out there on his own. Have you ever noticed how the challenges of, of your life have made you into a stronger Christian? This may be crazy, but when I was younger, I used to be really nervous about surgeries and stuff like that. And I would look at seniors, and, and I would see them go through this stuff time and time again. And they didn't seem to have the fear, and they just went through it. And somehow in my crazy mind, I was thinking, well, maybe as they get older, they're a little more numb to the pain, and they're just not feeling the pain like young people do who are so sensitive. And, and I was totally wrong, because it's just the opposite. The seniors feel even more pain as they go through. Do you know what the difference is? The young people haven't gone through those challenges. The seniors have had to endure it and go through it, and they've been able to face it. And through that, that experience of running through these things, they've gotten much more courageous when it comes to facing the difficult times in life because God is faithful, amen, and he'll help you through. And sometimes we have to do things that we really don't want to do. But as we go through them, God, God blesses us and he strengthens us for the future battles. Verse 37, moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. David's past experience, experiences had prepared him to take on this bear of a man who roared like a lion. You see, God was there for David in the past, and God would be there with David in the future. Goliath was intimidating. His coat of armor was overlapped with plates of bronze weighing approximately 125 pounds. Now, the amazing thing for me as we look at American soldiers today and we see them going into war, the backpacks that they carry are 75 pounds to 100 pounds. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine carrying that for long periods of time? Yet here Goliath had armor that weighed 125 pounds. The tip of the giant's javelin weighed 15 to 17 pounds, somewhere in that area. If you want to pick up a 15-pound weight and then think you're going to throw that, that gives you an idea of how strong this individual was. He was huge. He had a, a hat, a, a, a bronze hat that he had on his head, and, and it protected him. But it, it, was, it was much more prepared for war than the common soldier that just had a little leather cap that was over their head. This guy was a warrior. He was in it for keeps. Goliath was nine foot, nine inches tall, and it's estimated that his weight was probably somewhere in the, in the area of 600 to 700 pounds. He was a giant, and he had way more strength than the common man. And, and if, if you have any doubt at all, just think about the tip of the arrow, the tip of the spear, and how much that, that weight Verse 37b, and Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Yeah, I thought it's interesting that the one who really should have gone out there and fought with his giant would be King Saul. And why would I say that? Because Goliath was a giant, 
But this is what the Bible says about Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 2, through 2. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Ahiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice in a handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among all of the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. And so you've got all the people out there, and the one person who rises head and shoulders above everybody else is Saul. And so somebody's got to go out there and fight that giant. You would think that the one who would be, be picked to go out and fight that giant would be the big guy. He would be the one that would go out there, but the big guy was terrified of the really big guy. And so he looks to the boy David, the teen David, to maybe go out there. I think through all of this, we learned that Saul didn't have much faith in the Lord. He turned to a boy to do a man's job. So Saul was determined to have David fight Goliath, but he was determined to do that on his own terms. One of the things that we learn about King Saul is that he was a man of the flesh. And I think it's important for us to realize, too, back in 1 Samuel chapter 16, we see that when David was anointed, that the anointing was taken away from Saul. And so from that point on, he's tormented by evil spirits. Saul is a man who is operating in the flesh. And that's where we pick up the story here at this point. So Saul clothed David with his armor. And he put a bronze helmet on his head, and he also clothed him with a coat of mail, mail, or or he's uh, he's got armor on is what he's got. David fastened his sword to his armor, and he tried to walk, for he had not not tested them. And David said to Saul, "I, I can't walk like these, for I have not tested them. And so David took them off. Now think about this. The armor would have been set for Saul, who was head and shoulders above everybody else. You've got a teen David. It's possible that David was tall. We we don't know, but what's what's really obvious through all of this is that all of this armor on top of young David was very cumbersome, and he could barely move. Saul's thinking, well, we've got to fight him the way that he's dressed. And David's saying, I just, I can't, all I know is God wants me to fight this guy. I can't do this. This is too cumbersome for me. So young David told the king, no. He was going to do it God's way. Have you ever had to tell somebody in authority who's told you to do something that you know is not God's will in your life? No, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to bear the consequences. I think it's important that we stop here for just a moment and we take a look at young David as a teen because what he did took a great amount of courage. He walked up to the king and he said, no, I'm not going to do it your way. I'm going to do it God's way. And that's exactly what he did. Verse 40, then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and he put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and a sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistines. Now, I think it's interesting, the selection of weapons that, that, that David chose. Why didn't he choose the spear? Why didn't he choose a bow and arrow or something else, some, a, a pitchfork or whatever weapon they might have had in those days? Because David was comfortable using the slingshot. It was something that he knew how to do, and he was gifted with using them. The founder of the China Inland Mission, Hudson Taylor, said this. He said, all God's spiritual giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on him being with them. All God's giants have been weak men, and they do great things when they trust in God to be with them and to help them through that time. And so with a a shepherd's staff, a sling, and a shepherd's bag carrying stones, David goes out in order to meet Goliath. You know, I think it's important for us to see what happened here. David's using something that he is gifted in. He's going to go fight a battle for the ages. But he's using the giftedness that God has given to him. We've had several messages about giftedness and what our spiritual gifts are and where we fit best in ministry, how we we do this. 
So often we try to be like somebody else and we fall flat on our face. What we need to do is look at where that giftedness is and use that giftedness to God's glory because that is how God has equipped you for ministry. I used to work under a fantastic senior pastor. Some of you here know Pastor Mel Wiggers, and he ended up retiring. And I'll tell you, I, as a young pastor, I used to sit in the back of that sanctuary, which was absolutely packed with people, and be terrified. I would listen to this man who had been so uniquely gifted by God to teach the word of God. I'd look at the faces of people, totally into what he was saying, able to connect with them. And I'm sitting back there in terror saying, I can't do that. I can't do that. And I didn't want to preach. I was scared to death because that, that became the giant in my life. I was terrified to preach. How could I ever measure up to Pastor Mel's giftedness? Well, the truth of the matter is, I never could. I couldn't, because that was Pastor Mel's gift in this. And one of the greatest freedoms that came in my life is when I came to realize that I don't have to be Pastor Mel. I don't have to be anyone else. I have to be Mike Bernard. I have to be the person that God designed me to be, using the gifts that God has given me, to, and, and praise God for others with other gifts. But for each and every one of us, as we look around, it's so freeing to realize that, that we just need to be who God has made us to be. Amen? And it doesn't mean that my fear went away. I was terrified. There was times I threw up at night if I had to preach, and, and, and I couldn't sleep, but I had to face it. And I had to get on that bridge. And I had to go back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. And I still have to go back and forth. What fears are you facing? What giants are you facing in your life? Because we need to address those giants. We need to go at them rather than running from them. Well, being a shepherd could be incredibly boring out there with the sheep, it was a bad job. <laughs> but, but the shepherd, the shepherd uh, had a lot of free time. And one of the things that David, I'm sure, did is he would take that sling because in Israel there are rocks everywhere. And he'd take those little rocks and he'd be firing them all over just to kill time. Even while he was out there doing what he really didn't want to do, he was being trained for a bigger job that would be coming down the road. That job would be called King of Israel because he was learning how to lead, he was learning how to feed, he was learning how to guard, he was learning how to do all these things that you have to do with sheep. And sometimes even in our own life, we may be right now in a position that we don't want to be in, and God is training us, preparing us for something much bigger in the future because we're going through this time learning principles that we can later apply to our lives and to our ministries. So David's out there learning how to shoot, and he's getting pretty good at that. Well, in verses 41 and 42, it says, So the Philistines came, and they began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went out before him. Now, the Philistine, the Philistine comes out, this huge guy, but he's not alone. He's got a shield bearer in front of him. So he's got another individual who comes out walking in front of him. And so when the Philistine looked around, and then he saw David, he, dis he disdained him. For he was only a youth. He was ruddy and he was good looking. Goliath doesn't go out alone. He's got an accomplice with him. And here comes this teenage boy who Saul sends out alone and Goliath is offended. How dare you send him to me? And you're sending him out here alone? Well, Goliath was overconfident and he was about to find out that David was not alone. David had a companion with him with a capital C. That companion was God. Verse 43 and 44, so the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come out here with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods, probably Dagon and Ashereth. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. I was thinking about this and thinking about Goliath's size, and all I could think of is a WWF wrestler out there just mouthing off, you know. And that's kind of what, what he was doing there, trying to intimidate David with his mouth, and yet young David would not take any of that. Verse 45, then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and a javelin, 
But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. David wasn't looking at the giant. David had his eyes firmly planted upon God and what God could do. He wasn't alone. Like I said, he had that companion. Verse 46, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air, the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You see, what David was dealing right there with was something that was even worse than death in their minds. It was bad enough to die. Don't leave me for the birds. I don't want them plucking my eyes out. I don't want them eating my flesh. Don't leave me for the wild animals. I don't want them to be eating on me after I'm dead. And so this was worse to, to many of them than even death. You know, and, and all odds, humanly speaking, seem to be against David. And yet he stepped forward in faith, trusting God. What giant are you facing in your life? You know, is it a job loss, divorce, any number of things. Step forward in faith, trusting God. David continues, Then all this assembly shall, shall know that the Lord does not save with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. As you look at verse 47, the key words in that verse is the battle belongs to the Lord. When people go against you, when people start attacking you because you are a Christian, in reality, they're attacking the Lord. And that battle belongs to the Lord. And we need to remember that he's much more powerful than any giant that we might be facing. I used to love the Beatles when, when I was growing up and the music that they had. But as time went on, it uh, went from she loves you, yeah, 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 to literally blasphemy in Christ. And John Lennon, I think, was the worst at doing that. George Harrison wasn't far behind, but uh, John Lennon's dead. George Harrison is dead. You don't attack the Lord. You attack the Lord, you're going to have to pay the consequences on that. You know, people may blaspheme God, but I sure wouldn't want to be in their shoes when they do so. And Goliath was out here blasphemy in God. You know, when people attack our faith, we need to remember that the battle belongs to the Lord. Warren Worsby says this. He said, as a shepherd alone in the fields, he had learned to trust God. And as a faithful guardian of the flock, he had mastered the use of a sling. David had confident faith in God because he had found him dependable in the crises of life. And he knew that the Lord would not desert him. So David's strategy in all of this was to have faith in God than to use his speed, his mobility, his giftedness as he faced this giant. Usually stones were, were round and they're smooth. How, you guys ever do it on a river? You find stones and you start skipping them and, and, and you can find the right stones to use that are best. Well, if you're out there with the sheep all the time and you're firing, you learn the right stones to use. And so David's out there and he's looking for the stones that would be the very best. And a master slinger could go ahead and sling a stone 100 miles an hour. Now, can you imagine if you were standing in front of that stone what it would do to you? So if you got really, really good at that, you could sling it 100 miles an hour. We see in the book of Judges, it talks about the Benjamites. You had 700 of them could take them with their left hand, and they could sling those stones, and, and they were just deadly with them. It was, it was an art of war. They did not have swords in those days, except for two. Now, they had pitchforks. So you start using other things that are available, and in that part of the country, you've got stones that are everywhere. But imagine getting hit in the head by one of those stones at 100 miles an hour. Verse 48 and 49, so it was when the Philistines arose and they came and they drew near to meet David, that David hurried and he ran towards the army to meet the Philistines. You notice as they came to meet him, he didn't turn and run away like the other Israelites did. As they came to him, he ran at them. All of a sudden, now they're saying, what is this kid doing? You know, what, what's going on here? Then David put his hand in his bag. And he took out a stone and he slung it. 
And he struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sank into the forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. You know, as, as Joshua and Caleb went into the promised land, all the other Israelites are saying, look at the giants. They're too big. We can't handle them. We've got to go. It led to 40 years in the wilderness. But Joshua and Caleb are thinking, look at the size of those guys. How can we miss them? Well, I think David was kind of that way as well. So when he slung that stone, I think God supernaturally helped him. Where that, that rock went, first, first try, rock went dead center on Goliath's forehead. Probably the only place that was exposed that wasn't covered in armor. And immediately it went there and sunk right into his forehead. Verse 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and he killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. Why was there no sword in David's hand? Because iron in those days, iron in those days was a, a newer technology that was working its way in. Uh, today we hear a lot about the Palestinians. Uh, we look back and we, we hear uh, about the, the Gaza Strip right along the, the Mediterranean. And uh, even today as we talk about the, the, the land of Israel, so often you even hear Bible scholars saying Palestine. If we're going to be biblical about it, what should it be? It should be Canaan or Israel, because it was the land of Canaan when the, when the Jews went into it, and today we call it the land of, of Israel. What a lot of people don't realize is that the Philistines were known as the Sea People. They originated from the area of the Aegean Sea, some of the islands in that area. They had come over, and when they did, they brought the iron technology from that part of the world with them. They were more advanced at that time than the Israelites were. Uh, today, the Israelites are much more advanced than the Palestinians or many of the Arab nations. But that group of people were known as the Sea People because they came from the region of the Aegean Sea with all that modern technology, and so they were ahead of the Israelites. In those days, only King Saul... Only Jonathan had swords. And so here we see the battle goes on. The rock goes and it hits him right in the head. Verse 51 continues. Therefore David ran and he stood over the Philistine. He took his sword and he drew this, this massive sword that he had out of its sheath. And he killed him and he cut off his head with it. I think it's interesting that this story is very similar to the story that we see in 1 Samuel chapter 5. As you see the battle of the Ark of the Covenant, you see the Lord, battle of the Lord with the Ark of the Covenant against Dagon, the chief Philistine god. And it would have been Dagon that, uh, that Goliath was looking at. But here's how the story goes in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. When the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon. They set, set it by da Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early in the morning, this was their victory cry. They had captured the Ark of the Covenant. What are they going to do? They're going to put it in the temple of Dagon by Dagon. And so they, they go early in the morning, and there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon, and they set it back up again. In its place. Now, I got to give you a little background on Dagon. Dagon was the half fish, half man god of the Philistines. They believe that Dagon was the, the father of Baal. Now, you've heard of Baal worship. We see it all through Scripture. The Philistines believe that Dagon was the father of Baal. So they took Dagon and they set it in place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon, both palms and his hands were broken off on the threshold. And as all of the people walked in and they saw that, they said, Dagon. <laughs> well, <laughs> but what I want you to see here, I'm just joking there. But what I want, what I want you to see here is that in both places, you've got the, the god Dagon, before the god of Israel, falls down and loses his head. Falls right on his face, boom, and loses his head. And now you've got the champion of the Philistines who worship Dagon. Gets hit square in the head, falls on his face, boom, and he loses his head. 
So in both cases, you've got a double picture here of what's happening. As a result of that, the Philistines, they spread out and they began to flee. I don't know if you've ever noticed in your own life, but cowardliness is contagious. Have you ever seen that? And that's with the armies. That's why it's so important that you don't get somebody who deserts and you've got to deal with that person. Because if that cowardliness hits and everybody begins to flee, then you've lost your army. But that's exactly what ends up happening. So they just, they, they take off and, and they begin to flee. They're going every which direction. But in verse 51, it says, when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now, do you remember the promise that, that Goliath had made earlier to the Israelites? This is what he said in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 8 through 9. Then he, Goliath, stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel, and he said to them, why have you come out of the line to line up for battle? He's seen all the Israelites lining up. Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you, the servants of Saul, choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. You kill me, we're your servants. If I kill you, which seemed like a, a sure thing, you're our servants. And as soon as the big guy goes down, boom, do the Philistines say, okay, we are your servants? What do they do? They turn and they run. Don't you see that with the enemy so often today? I mean, we can look around the world and you think you're going to do things honorable and away they go. They just, they, they go ahead and they take off. And that cowardliness is contagious. But did you know as well that courage is contagious? Because when the, or when the Philistines fled, the Israelites took off after them. And they, the, because of the, the movement of David, because of the victory of David, now all of these people were encouraged. And that, 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 that courage just spread through the Israelite army. And they began chasing them. And it all started with young David trusting God. Well, what kind of giants are you facing in your life today? Are you allowing fear to get the better of you? Or are you dependent upon God to help you face whatever giant that is in your life? The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And in Romans 8, 3, Paul also says, excuse me, in Romans 8, 31, Paul also says, if God is for us, who can be against us? So I don't know what you're going through right now. We look so often at the story of David and Goliath as a children's story that's reserved for Sunday school. But I've got to tell you, it's for each and every one of us as we look at these giants and we see some of those principles that we trust God and then we face our fear. Amen? Because so long as you run from God, so long as you allow fear to dictate, you will never reach all of the blessings that God would have for you in life and in ministry. But if you go head on to whatever that might be, God's got special blessings reserved for you. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the story of David and Goliath. And Lord, I know I've had areas of fear in my life and still do that I have to face every week. And, uh, Lord, I know that this, many of the people here are facing major giants in their life right now, and they don't know what to do. Well, Lord, I pray each and every one of us would trust you. And then I pray that, that in courage, in boldness, that we would move forward, Lord, knowing that you are able and that our hope would be upon you. And so we thank you for this time in your word. And, Lord, today, if there's anyone here who's heard this message, who's never received Christ, I pray that they not... Uh, not walk out of here, not turn off their device that they're watching on until they deal with the situation, the situation that we call sin that separates us from you, that controls our life. Lord, I pray that we would repent of that sin, that we would turn to you, that we would trust you. And if there's someone here today that would like to pray to receive Christ, I, I pray that they would pray something like this, not that it's a magical formula, but Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Lord, I have sinned so terribly against you, and I just ask for your forgiveness. 
I ask that you come into my heart and life, Lord. Help me to be the kind of person that you desire for me to be. Lord, this day I surrender my life to you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing with us. strength to the Lord, glory and honor. Well, the battle belongs to the Lord, whatever it is that we're facing today. Uh, I want to encourage you guys on your communication sheets, if you could fill those out with any prayer requests that you have. Uh, As we conclude today, if you're wrestling with something and you need prayer, I'm going to ask a couple of the elders to come up with me up here in the front, and we can be praying for you. Uh, Also, we're looking, like I said, of getting the, the baptismal tank out soon, and if you're interested in and being baptized, just write on your slip, and then we'll get a hold of you, and we can make arrangements for that, because there will be a baptism service coming soon. I guarantee you that. Lord, thank you so much for this day as we, we gather and worship. And I pray that as we leave here, Lord, that we would leave here with the courage of knowing that the battle belongs to you. And so thank you for the incredible love that you've given to us in Christ. And I just pray that each and every day, Lord, that we would draw ever closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.